Hi there, we're back at the Washington State Convention Center for Build 2017, and I have here some special guests. Like, they have done some crazy cool work, and I'm super <laughs> excited to talk about it. We talked about it a little bit last year before we get into it. Why don't we introduce ourselves and remind you that we are taking questions. I am watching them here, so make sure you submit your questions about this really interesting technology. Let's start with you, my good friend. Yeah, uh, I'm Ben Hillis. I'm a developer for Windows Subsystem for Linux. Fantastic, yeah. and we both went to the University of Utah. Go Utes. Thank you. Yeah. You, sir? <laughs> I'm Jack Hammonds. I'm a program manager for the Windows subsystem for Linux. Fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm uh, Gilles Cousam. I'm the development lead for the Windows console, which goes pair hand in hand with the Windows subsystem for Linux. Like, I mean, you, you folks got some feedback on the console, and you're like, well, let's just put Linux in, right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> like, it's like the craziest thing. And I've, I've spent some time looking at this. It's amazing the work you've done. But before we get to that, let's talk first, for those that don't know what it is, what is the Windows subsystem for Linux, and why is it important? Sure. Uh, so the Windows subsystem Linux is a way for uh, you to run native win Linux applications on Windows without having to recompile them mm -hmm. and without a virtual machine. So we, are a, uh, we have a driver that sits between the NT kernel and Linux user mode okay. that does this translation and uh, exposes virtual files and that type of thing. So let me see if I understand this right, right because there's something called break wine, down. right? Right. It's not that. Jack, what do you say? It's not quite that. <laughs> it's got a lot of differences. So Wine is a project that lets you run your Windows applications on Linux. This is sort of the other way around. Oh, so sorry. I got it backwards. <laughs> but it's like a Wine for Windows? It's, right. it's similar to a Wine for Windows, but I would call it Wine for Windows plus a whole bunch more. Okay. I mean, not only is it just that bare minimum level of just making sure that your applications run, but we do a whole lot to integrate the Linux environment into the Windows environment and make that a seamless experience for people. Okay, so when I'm when you're saying I'm running Linux stuff, is it true? Like, am I compiling? Let's just say I have a binary that I'm downloading for Ubuntu, for example. Is that the same binary that's running on my Windows box? Yes, it is. So the image that we take is the essentially the server image that Ubuntu runs in their containers, running straight on Windows. No modifications, no recompile. Not, it's not a Windows application. It is a native Linux application executing in the Windows context. Yeah, so when you're, when you're in the WSL prompt, you open a, a, a console window. You type in bash. You're in WSL. You can type sudo apt-get install, whatever you want. I mean, it, it all just works. Now, again. <clears throat> I studied some operating systems at the glorious University of Utah, of course. <laughs> and I remember knowing that there was two aspects of running a process. One was in the kernel mode, and obviously the other was in the user mode. What are we talking about here when we're talking about running this process? Are we talking about user mode? Are we talking about kernel mode? Ben? Right. So, so WSL is, uh, we implement the kernel ABI surface for... Um, for the Linux kernel. Okay. So all of the system calls that uh, the Linux kernel has, it's 360 something um, system calls. We also implement a lot of virtual files. Um, there's proc pro files in the proc directory that aren't actual files on disk. They will tell you information about the system, like your CPU information or what mounts you have on the machine. Um, we also uh, expose those via our driver. So you are literally, you made a driver that represents Linux. Right. Like, you're kind of blowing right. my mind. Please explain a little bit more, Jack. You're the PM. You've got to be able to tell <laughs> us all this good stuff, right? I'll see what I can do. Okay. So, I, to start out, the main genesis behind this project is, you know, you're, you're a Windows developer. You spend right. all your time on Windows. You go out and you look for tools that you want to run, be it Node or Ruby or any web server uh, or any tool or application that helps you get your work done. Uh, and not, sometimes you're, run, you're scrolling through these how-to pages and... and reading the instructions, and all of a sudden you hit a dollar sign prompt. And that dollar sign prompt just makes you go, oh, that's, that's, uh, not, that's quite, not what I have. This is right. not what I have. This is right. not my machine. Right. Uh, we wanted to eliminate that from your, from your perspective. So post this project, you see that dollar sign, you know that this is for me. Like I can run any tool that I would normally run on, on, on Linux, now directly on Windows. So are we talking like, because I'm going to be honest with you, since we're all amongst friends and maybe my mom is watching, right? It's a pain in the butt to do like Ruby things on Windows. 
It's always been easier to do it on Linux. Yeah, you're, well, well what, what happens a lot is a lot of the mainline feature development for these web platforms are happening on Linux, right? right? And so the Windows versions and, and a lot of times the Mac versions are a few releases behind right. because they have to get ported over to those platforms. Sure. So this allows you to run the most recent version, the same version you'd be running um, on a Linux machine, but on Windows. So how does this work, right? Because when I'm looking at a process in Windows, Pro, there's, there's certain things that happen in a process. How do you like circumvent that? I mean, because right. if you're using the real ELF64 binaries, which yeah. is what this thing, if you GCC something, it goes to ELF64 on a Linux box. Right. Like there's system calls in there because you can do everything in user mode, but every once in a while you're going to need to get a packet from the network card, for right. example. Or you're going to do a get command or something. Like how are you, how does this get read, what kind of sorcery, I guess, is what I'm asking, are you doing to make this work? Right. So there is a technology called Pico Processes, okay. which comes from Project Drawbridge, which is, think of it as an empty address space. It doesn't have any of the Windows concept of a PEB or a TEB, and it just loads up your pages in there and starts executing code. And it's got a table that is provided by the Linux, files, or Linux driver for the system calls. When a system call is essentially trying to get executed in that process, it goes to the Linux driver that converts it to a Windows NT kernel system call and gets executed there. But, that, I mean, but I'm, I'm thinking about this, right? I remember when I did my, because everything we did in college started with Linux, right? right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a system call that I know does not work on Windows. And it has to do with a utensil, right? A fork. Right. <laughs> like, that's a system call, right? Right. The, and, and I remember thinking about this, like, why do you do this? When you fork, it literally clones a process, and then you redo stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. That's not possible in Windows, right? Not from user mode, no. So what... <laughs> What are you doing to make that work? Th that's, that's one of the more complicated system calls. So the, I bet there was a order. list of, yeah. there, how many system calls did you say there were? Three, maybe 400, 350. So you, you went through and like probably 80% were like super easy. And then you got to like fork and were like, ah. Yeah, well fork, it, it turns out you run in the fork really, really early. You okay. know? I mean, fork is used extensively in Linux. It's, it's really kind of the way that you create a new thread. It's how you get the um, PID, right? That right. you know but new process is running, right? Right, and it's, you know, there's pthread libraries that use the clone system call, which is, it's, clone is really just a more complicated version of fork. Fork For is threads, right? Right, yeah, well fork is clone with some flags kind of implied. Got it. And it'll give you, um, you'll share the address space and then you'll be another thread running in the same, in the same process. And then clone, if you specify different flags, it'll let you modify that behavior. I see. But, but at Fork, we have to, we essentially take the currently running thread and we create a new one and then we copy, you know, all of the address space information into that new thread, set up things like the uh, executable name, the instruction pointer, that type of thing. And then you have two threads that are I identical with different PIDs. Are these processes or threads? Threads. Okay. Yeah. So, so the, the terminology in, uh, in, in, lin in the Linux world about processes and threads is pretty vague. On the manual page, they actually allude to this a lot of times. They say, even though it says thread, a lot of times we mean process. So you just it, you kind of have to look at okay. it okay. in context sometimes. Um, but yeah, so you, at the end of the system call, you have your calling thread and you have a new thread. The calling thread returns uh, like zero for success. Or no, it returns the, the pit of your child process, or uh, you know, a negative one if it fails. Right. Uh, your new process, that same system call returns a zero, which means I'm the child, and then they just go on and, and on their own lives. And usually, immediately after a fork, you'll have a branch instruction like a for, mm -hmm. I mean, an if statement that will say, oh, if I'm the child, I want to run this, and if I'm the parent, I want to, a lot of times, wait for the child to exit or do something else. I mean, uh, this is amazing because this is all being done in a driver. Right. Yeah. So effectively, you have abstracted Linux like if it was a network card, for example. In, in a way, yeah. So we, the driver we call, uh, Jill alluded to it, it's called a, like a Pico driver. I so see. when you, these processes, you, you register the driver and say, this driver knows my system call table. So don't call the NT version when I do the syscall instruction. Call me, and I'll handle it. And then 
Yeah. That's awesome. So like we've talked about this a little bit. I want to see if you could show us some magic here, Jack, on how this is. So I saw the announcement today that this was actually now from the Windows Store. You can go and install it instead of having to do that weird ad. Is that true? Right. Well, it, it will be very soon. Uh, that, that will be released in Insider Builds probably in a few months. Awesome. Um, and then it will be available in the Fall Creators Update, uh, which comes out this fall. And for now, you just need to add. It's like add a new system. It's like there, there's a add remove programs yeah. and then add like components. Right. I think there's, there's two components of Windows subsystem for Linux. And one is the inbox binaries, which is the driver that we've talked about, okay. and a user mode service, and a couple command line binaries, bash.exe, for example. Sure. Um, and then the other component is the user mode. And okay. that, that's the piece that you'll be getting from the store. Awesome. So why don't you show us what you got, Jack? Yeah, so one of the coolest parts of this project is the fact that the Windows file system and the Linux file system are so close to each other that you can do things on the Windows side that affect the Linux side and, and vice versa. Okay. So if we look right here, if I can get in that window. So we're in my home directory. Okay. This is my Linux home directory. This is like if you logged into a, a Linux machine and I, I mean, if I do CD tilde, it's going to take me to the exact same place, the same, same home directory. So now when you want to get to your Windows files, where are those going to be? Like, yeah, it feels like you're in this weird land, it's and like now how do we get out of Oz, zone, right? Exactly, yeah. So, so to get out of Oz, nice. Uh, we got to put on the red shoes. We're going to put on the red <laughs> shoes. Those we're are the red shoes. Put on nice. the red shoes by going to our mount points. And that's interesting, right? Because you're treating Windows as if it was a mounted drive. Exactly, exactly. Right. right. Nice. So if we go to uh, mount C, I uh, ls here. See, I don't have permission to uh, view some files. That's just because I, I launched this terminal as a user, okay. as a Windows user that didn't have permission to those files. Holy cow. So keeping in mind, this, this system right here is it bounded by my Windows permissions. So, so you can't be sneaky and be like, oh, now I'm in Linux. Oh, like, I'm going to so go start I'm looking at all this other like right. a delete system. The red shoes are not that whatever. good is what you're They're saying. They're not quite that good. <laughs> nice. so, what this allows me to do is, uh, like I said, talk to my talk to my Windows files. So uh, they're all here. I can uh, CD into my users directly directory somewhere. It looks like it's going off the end of the. There we yeah. go. We'll just expand this up. Yeah. There you go. There we go. So I can uh, CD into my users directory. Uh, see my users. There's. Uh, I think that's the one I'm logged into. Go up to my desktop. And boom, there is my desktop. Now, I don't have much on there at the moment. Yeah, I hid your icons because you oh, have a lot. Yeah, of well, but. Oh, <laughs> but <if Wow>. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, so, so, so your icon, so that's literally you're now on the Windows right. side. Yes, yeah, so I right. could uh, make it dirty. You can't see it. But we'll call it test. Oh, you hid my. Yeah, you could open it yeah. in Explorer. And okay, so, it. Yeah. so if I had Explorer open, I, I would see a, f a folder that I just made there directly. Well, if you right click on your desktop, let me, this is a little secret that I right, oh, right click on your desktop. Oh, there you go. That yeah, works too. Yeah, there, there they are. You can see all my secret files here. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so if I uh, make a directory. Okay, DIR test. It's unfortunate we can't see this. Uh, yeah, it's going next up here. I'm just going to have to take my yeah. word for it. So yeah. basically, what would happen is oh, there it is right there. Okay. I called it Tet. That's perfect. <laughs> so my desktop is represented not only in this Windows file view right here, but also on the Linux side. So I can, I can see my files on the Linux side, uh, edit them, do everything as right. I would expect. But is on the file system, because I, I, there's no chmod, for example, for files in Windows. Right. So what kind of permissions, I mean, I'm trying to understand how you make these two things map together. Right. So you'll have the permissions of your Windows user. Got so, it. So we do a little bit, if you do like LL, it'll show you the user and the, and the group. Um, we do a little bit of fudging to kind of to make things appear. We'll say, oh, this is the mode of this file, which Got is it. the way Linux represents uh, permissions. But um, when you're in one of the mount directories, it is a little bit of a of an illusion, and it's right. and and uh, we're working on making that better, on making it more uh, match more closely to what what it, the the real word real permissions are, um, but yeah. So so, to be clear, this isn't like a VM. No. Uh, so because of that, how do you handle networking? So it's the same networking stack that is shared by the by Linux and Windows. So okay. if you open a port on Linux it will be open to be accessed from the Windows side. I see. The, the, the simple use case is I want to run a Linux web server, and now you can access it directly from Edge and see what's oh, going I on. See. So if you use up port 80 on the Linux side, 
and you try to open that port on the Windows side, it'd be like, hey, that port's being used. Right. right. Okay. But if you access it, it will access it on the Linux side. Because the Pico process is responding to the calls. On and, it. it's, and is local to that machine. I and, see. and if you went into the Windows firewall and you blocked access to port 80, it wouldn't be able to access that port. All of the, all of the management tools that are built into Windows just work seamlessly directly with the Windows. I don't know, Ben. Your beard isn't long enough to <laughs> make this stuff work like this. It was longer last year. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> so here's some questions. Is the domain authentication propagated to WSL? First of all, what does that mean, and then why does it work? Yeah, the, it's, well, you'll have the same, uh, the domain authentication means like your domain user. Mm -hmm. Is that, yeah, it, it, you'll have the same access to, to network shares. So actually another thing um, that we've added recently, th this is in the most recent creator uh, uh, insider build, mm -hmm. is we've added support for mounting uh, external drives, so uh, fat drives or USB sticks or CDs, um, as well as network shares. So um, the, this is relevant to like the domain credentials. So if, you, if you're logged into your domain account and you want to access a web, a web server that your work uses to, to store something, you right. would be able to do that from within WSL as of the creator, uh, the insider build from a few weeks ago. And, and that's brand new. It's, like I said, your beard is just is not long <laughs> enough. Now, here's a question from John, which to me is really interesting, and maybe you can clarify. Does Docker work with WC WSL? Or if it does, how does it work? You want to take this one? So uh, Docker is an incredibly important tool in the upcoming containerization of everything. Of course. Uh, and we 100% understand that. And it's something that we're very closely tracking and uh, you know, working on supporting within the Windows subsystem. Uh, having said that, it's not trivial. Uh, I, think everything, I think it's important to say that everything that we do is groundbreaking in some sense because we're at that pinnacle of what it is that makes Linux and Windows different. And it's a non-trivial thing to just go out and support some new thing. So Docker is an example of one of those. And uh, over the coming months and years, we'll be working on supporting that uh, yeah. to a yeah. fuller extent. Docker is built on top of um, s some features that the Linux kernel added not, not very long ago, and it took them years to do. I um, see. And, and we're, in, in many ways, our project is trying to catch up to you know, 15, 20 years of, of Linux kernel development. And it's, it's, it's a difficult task. There's only seven or eight of us, and ten, maybe 10 of us, if, if you include the, the, the Everyone the does obviously doesn't have beards that are long <laughs> enough. <laughs> I went to school with him. It's yeah, okay. he was my TA, so he's just, he's just ripping on me. Um, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> so let's talk about, for those that know about WSL, that are starting to get a sense for this notion of these processes coexisting. They're not VMs, they're not containers. Yep. They're literally processes that coexist. One just happened to go through a driver, and others just go directly to the kernel. Tell me, what are some of the new things that have come out since we've spoken last year? So I think, uh, first and foremost, the support for Xenial. That's uh, Ubuntu's version 16.04. Uh, it's their long-term servicing branch, and it's where you're going to get the most stable, up-to-date environment for uh, interfacing with all of the tools and, and, and applications that you expect to work on Linux. So that was a big thing for us. Being able to support that was right out of the gate, and creator's update is, was very important. And so now we're, because before it was like 14.0 something, right? Yeah, 14.04, yeah. 1404. now we support 16.04. Right. Yeah, so a funny point in there is, I mean, what, what it actually means to support uh, a Linux distribution in this way in many ways, it's kind of arbitrary. I mean, we, we are constantly improving the level of system calls, at the, the level of integration that we have with the uh, Windows OS, and the number of system calls that we support, and the flags on them, and it's very fluid. So we support uh, a whole bunch of distributions, but the question is, at what fidelity? And so in that process, we need to determine what Linux kernel version we support or that we report up to, up to the user space land. I uh, see. So in, uh, you'll have to correct me on this, but in anniversary update, we supported 3.6. I think that's right, yeah. Uh, we reported 3.6, and in the creators update, we're reporting 4.4. Uh, 4.4 4, 4 or 3, I think, yes, yeah. Yes. And that's just like, because it's funny how you say we report. It's yeah, because right. the driver says anytime it gets the version, it's like, oh, we're this. I mean, right. it's not Linux. It's it's yeah. WSL. It's so a, it's it is kind a of a lie. Kernel, yeah, because yeah. we 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 aren't it's Linux. Not, you guys so. are all liars. <laughs> <laughs> well, some things rely on that version number, right? So we we try to pick the one that's closest to the system calls that we support. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the boundaries of this stuff because it feels like. Like, have you implemented all the system calls? Are there some edges where we need to be aware of where if something goes wrong and we don't start swearing because we know about it? So we've, we've always known that we can't support everything that Linux does. 
And so we try to focus on the majority of calls that applications use and see how they use it. And when something isn't there, we'll try to log it to, figure, to understand, oh, this is a system call that isn't supported yet. And that way, that helps us drive the development to know where we need to invest and what people are using that isn't working properly. Yeah, so to do this, it's fascinating because we just run the unit tests of the tools that we expect to run on Linux on WSL. So you, like, you go out to Node, and they've got you know, hundreds of unit tests that go out and, and check their functionality and make sure that every time that they build Node, they're not messing something up. So we run those same unit tests on WSL, and we have a great blog post I encourage everyone to go look at That's uh, that, that dives in deep into the exact results that we get out of these tests and what, and what it's told us over time. So here's another question, and, and we spoke to this earlier, uh, Ben, on a different video. Is there a way to interact between a process, like for example, when I do less, <laughs> right, and I pipe it to something else, right, is there a way to interact with different kind of processes, be one being in Windows, the other being in Linux? Yeah, so that was probably one of the bigger features that we, we released in uh, the, the creator's update, was the ability to, uh, A, launch Windows applications from inside of the, uh, the Bash environment. Which is, can't be a trivial thing. It, it, was, it was complicated, but it was, it was overwhelmingly one of our highest requested features. Right. So when we, when we decide what we're going to work on, we look at kind of three things. We look at um, our user voice, we look at GitHub and when people report issues, and we also look at our telemetry, which tells us, us um, areas that we don't have implemented and, and it'll tell us what's, what's missing. Sure. So uh, yeah, interoperability was a big one for our users and, and people have really liked the, the new functionality. Can you show us something crazy that again is going to yeah, maybe yeah, run like ipconfig.exe or something. I'm going to just open a new terminal. Looks like I'm using experimental builds of Windows oh, that we ooh. daily build, yeah. so it uh, sometimes things aren't. Yeah. He's eating the dog food. This is possible. <laughs> no, no uh, pressure, right? Yeah, exactly. So right now we're in CMD. This is the standard right. shell that's been on Windows since nearly the beginning. Uh, and if I use dir, I can list all my files out there, and of I course. can see that since I'm in my uh, user directory, it looks like I've got my contacts and desktop and sure. documents. Uh, now, if I wanted to, say, find a specific file or folder in, in this directory, I mean, I've got a couple options. I can pipe it to find string, but I don't really know how to use find string very well. <laughs> right, because you're a Linux person. I'm more of a <laughs> Linux guy, so I do know how to use grep. Oh, man, you're going full grep. Oh, yeah, so what I can do is let's say I want to grep for, I don't know, my desktop. So I'll grep for desk. So I've got dir, which is a Windows command, a pipe, and then I'm piping it into a, a bash. Everyone Correct. better back up. Things might, things might catch things on fire. Crazy. Feels like. So uh, obviously that returns, and it pipes it through, and grep responds. Okay, so no should. fires. No, no fire, uh, exactly. But uh, and you can do this the other way. So I could say bash dash c. Uh, and I get ls. I like ls dash, dash uh, a l h. Right, I think it course. feels like give me the proper amount of yeah, information. Uh, <laughs> I, I always go a l. Looks like someone goes for the h. H too. is key because human readable, so it gives it to you in like. Oh, oh snap! Oh. Yeah. I learn something every wow. day. Wow! It's go. like we should record this. I mean, this is Seriously. really good stuff. <laughs> honestly. <laughs> so in this case, I will use fine string because it's it's honestly not that bad. Of oh, okay, okay. And then in this case, we'll look for a desk as well. It's no grep. Uh, so in this case, uh, it, it provides you a little bit more information. Uh, some of that's faked, and we've discussed that earlier, but it works the same way. Piping back and forth. You can pipe these multiple times right. to each other. It's all sorts of crazy that's stuff. That's kind of amazing because I will tell you that my first machine learning algorithm that I ever wrote used sed and awk. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> and I was like, oh, I'm just doing command line machine learning. Don't mind me on Linux. <laughs> and it's cool that... Those commands, do they work in this? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Those okay. were some of the first things that we targeted. Sed, grep, awk. Uh, I mean, those are just the staples of the Windows operating system. That's awesome. So tell me, I, I don't know if we talked about this, but where are the edges? Where are we going to find some of the holes so that people know? I don't know if we, I know you said you ran the unit test, but I don't know if you actually told me where should we be careful. Yeah, so, uh, so in, in terms of the unit test, one of the, the big projects that we use to test our project is uh, LTP. It's the Linux test project. Okay. Um, it, we mention our results in the blog in more detail, and uh, we actually have about an 80% pass rate of the system calls that we, we actually implement. 
which um, yeah. LTP tests a lot of the system calls, and many of them are kind of obscure or not used in practice, sure. or they're the 16-bit version or something. Um, but of the ones that, that they uh, test, we're, we're at about 80% pass rate, so that's pretty good. Um, it's a solid B, Ben. Yeah, that's, you know, I'd graduate <laughs> with that. <laughs> I maybe did graduate with that. Um, but then, uh, so areas that, that, that need some work, we mentioned um, the namespacing APIs that okay. Docker relies on. Um, uh, networking is a huge, huge surface area, so there's, um, there's socket options that we don't support. Raw sockets are or another area that we have some limited support for. Um, the, uh, excuse me, Netlink sockets. Um, those are a few areas, uh, different file system type things. Uh, I think the important takeaway here is that as we start to chip away at this mountain of, of compatibility. Yeah, you're making an operating system in yeah, the driver. I mean, there's so, right. so much going on there that each little change that we make enables so much stuff. I yeah. mean, sometimes we'll like, make a system call work, and all of a sudden, just this, these random tools will work, and people will tell us, thank you so much. And we're like, well, what, what, what do we do? I saw a weird, someone like made X windows like pop up somehow. <laughs> like, I don't know what kind of wizardry is happening there, but that's kind of amazing. It, it isn't something that we specifically went after. I mean, no. that, that was such a surprise to us <laughs> when someone showed it. Uh, like uh, getting Xterm to work and piping their, uh, their GUI over the, over the network. Uh, it's not something that we specifically went out to support, but I mean, we're not going to block it or anything. Sure, it's, sure, it's absolutely. Kinda, yeah, it's great. So for those that are that are, are watching, we have like three minutes, not so much time left. What's the future of WSL? What are some things that we're working towards? Obviously, full fidelity is something that is a huge dream. I don't know if it's possible to do it, but what are we working towards? So if you <coughs> listen to the keynote this morning, Terry Myerson announced that we are going to have distributions available in the store and we will support more than Canonical. Canonical has been a great partner for our first year in this uh, in the system, but other systems also are important to users. Like SUSE, so right? We will have SUSE, we will have Fedora, they will be available in the store, and you can run these distributions simultaneously. Right. So not only will you need to choose one that you're running, but you can run one set of tools in Ubuntu, another set of tools in Fedora. I feel like my machine's going to catch on fire if I do this. I mean, well, literally. Yeah, well, that's actually one of the cool things about this is that a lot of well, is that we're lower overhead than a VM. So when, of we, when we spin this up, it's like three or four processes. And it, when you spin up a VM, you have to segment your address space and you have to right. dedicate yeah, this. Translate. Address you have translation. to run an entire another operating system, right? right? And if you just want to run GCC, we can run you know, GCC and maybe one or two other processes and you can get what you need done. That's amazing. And so now that we've like explored this notion of a Pico process, kind of like a, like a, a process with no home unless it has a driver. Right. Were you making new drivers for Fedora and SUSE, or is it working through the same Windows subsystem for Linux? I think the goal with this project has always been to be distro agnostic. So Windows, the Windows subsystem for Linux doesn't take any hard dependencies on the fact that we started with Ubuntu or, right. or anything like that. It's, it's all about supporting every operating system uh, pretty much equally. So yeah, there's no, no hard dependencies. Right. And historically, if people remember Project Astoria, this is kind of the predecessor to that in a lot of ways. So um, it's our historical roots are, are Android, and the driver actually did not need that many changes to start running real Linux. Um, it was mostly just moving it to AMD 64, and then things, you know, we were running a shell in no time. I was his TA, but I take no credit for all of this goodness, because <laughs> there's no way I could ever do anything like this. So here's, a, here's a, one last question as we finish up. Uh, will WSL support Fuse file systems in the future? That's, that's been a highly requested feature on our user voice. I, and I know, I know one of our devs has, has spec that out and is looking at the work. Um, I don't know what the timetable looks like for that, okay. but yeah. What's the Fuse file system? It's a way, is that the user mode one? That's a, yeah, it allows right. you to write uh, a user mode driver to interop with uh, either other file systems. Got it. Or you can even interop with different programs, and it's, yeah, it does a lot of stuff. Right. So it's definitely on the radar. It's, it's on our definitely. radar, though. We, we're looking at it. Awesome. Well, like I said, every time I talk to you folks about this stuff, I am, like, I had to write an operating system one time in, in grad school, and I did not know I had that many hours in a day to work on a program. 
<laughs> because I had due dates and stuff. And so it's amazing work you're doing. We're very appreciative. At least I am as a dev. Uh, we'll uh, we'll leave out here. Uh, if there's uh, what, if people want to learn more, where can they go before we go? We have a great blog. Just Google or Bing WSL blog. <laughs> you will find it. He turned a little. Look at that. Good oh, wow. for you. Well, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks so much for taking the time for us with us. Uh, again, we're here at the Washington State Convention Center for Build 2017 Edition. Coming up next, we're going to talk about Net Standard and .NET. We'll see you in a second.